Hello, can we do the inevitable sound check? Can everyone hear in the back? I can't see you, so just gesticulate. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. We've got a cracking panel over here, so I'm going to go through a presentation just to tee us up and get us all awake after our morning coffees, and then they're going to be the stars of the show, really giving some very interesting and diverse perspectives on facial recognition technology and biometrics in general. So without further ado, let's get started. What are biometrics? I won't dwell long on this slide. I just put it up here in case there's anyone who wasn't entirely sure. Biometrics is simply data about your body, OK? So this could be anything from your face, your voice, how you walk, which is known as your gait, your iris, any parts of your eye that could be scanned, and so on. Maybe. The only biometrics that are currently covered in law here in the United Kingdom, specifically named, are DNA and fingerprints. And that's for police use, not for anywhere else in the government, and not for the private sector. Okay, so yes, it might be covered under things sort of broadly and loosely, like the Data Protection Act or the European GDPR. But in terms of naming it specifically, and that does matter, it's just DNA and fingerprints for now. I'm here to tell you that I think that matters, and I would like to see the United Kingdom lead the way in Europe and indeed in the world in coming up with a world-class legislation that decides how we want to treat this technology. Do we want to use it at all? Which is an important first step. And then if we decide that we do, under what conditions, with what oversight, and with what legal protections for all of us as citizens and consumers. Of the biometrics that our many, many technologists have today, the ones that I think are probably the creepiest are your face, your voice, and your emotions, because they are the easiest ones to capture without your knowledge. This is not the realm of sci-fi. This is happening now. It's not just happening in this country. It is happening all over the world. So we need to do this, not just for ourselves, but for the world that we're building for our kids. The fact is, biometrics are very compelling as a technology to solution to a lot of problems. And we're going to discuss them, and we want to give those problems and solutions a fair hearing in the debate that we're going to have. It really can be more convenient to pay with your face if you've run out of cash, or the ATM's not working, or there's a problem with your card. It also can solve the problem of fraud. If someone has stolen your card, they can't use it because you pay with your face. That, of course, assumes that you can't ever change somebody's face data or steal their face, as we just saw with Customs and Border Patrol in the United States only this week. So we still want to challenge that, that assumption, but it sounds logical, so we're going to go with it just for this point. Um, I loved surveillance as a service. In the United States, there are people who are selling this technology as a way of keeping track of your loved ones, your children, or your elders who might have Alzheimer's or dementia and get lost. Right? So this is a way of, of keeping track on people. And those are real problems. Is biometrics the solution to that problem, or the best solution to that problem? Um, it's a way of not having to remember all of your passwords. You could use a password manager. You could write them down on a piece of paper. Or you could be like me, constantly forget your passwords and have to call people up and reset them. Or you could pay, or you, so you could use your biometrics, your fingerprints your face, lots of us already do that on our phone. There's a lot more that could be done with that. So that solves that problem. It could save time. In the United States, where Americans love convenience and things that are faster, you can get through an airport faster. So from curb to gate in nine minutes, right? And like, let's be honest, going to the airport is a real pain in a post 9-11 world. So that's a pretty compelling argument for a lot of people. Save money. Um, this is not for you, the consumer or the citizen, but for businesses looking to explore this technology. If you can have pay with a face, you don't need to have as many staff to handle those transactions. People can just pay via a kiosk, right? They can just sort of show up, transact. Um, we were talking earlier today before this talk that if you wanted to check into a hotel, you wouldn't have to go up to reception or talk to the concierge. You just go in, they know it's you, you get your fob and off you go to your room. No need to have a human at all. If you're a hotel business, you've just saved tons of money on staff. 
right? And my favorite, of course, is fighting crime, because that's the one that we're going to be spending quite a lot of time talking about today. Criminals and terrorists won't get very far with facial recognition technology if, indeed, it were to be ubiquitous, rolled out all over our cities and countries, no, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide if we can track you. Um, you could even, if you wanted, and of course people will, want to start using this as part of your predictive analytics capabilities as a police force, and indeed the intelligence services too. You could surveil places like high crime neighborhoods, right? So get into places beforehand and watch and see what everyone's doing. And the argument that we use in this country specifically, and I just learned actually earlier this week that it was in fact official policy here in 2003, is literally, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Um, I have problems with that argument, so we're going to start talking about some of them now. But first I want to take us to another country, to China, to talk about how facial recognition is being used there. It's being used in ways that don't necessarily link to the ones that I just listed. And I think it's really important for us to think about that, because it's not just what we're going to be doing with that technology, it's what's being done with it globally. So here is a woman who has to have her face scanned in order to get some loo roll. The problem that this technology is solving is that in China, they had an epidemic of people stealing loo rolls from public toilets, right? So, because it was expensive, and it was just cheaper to steal it. So the way that they solved it was to put facial recognition technology into the public loos, and then you go scan your face, get your couple pieces of paper, into the loo you go. We're not talking about fighting crime or terrorism anymore. Here you are at work, getting recognized and scanned. Are you meant to be in this office? That's a security thing. Um, but also just, where are you in the office? Who are you interacting with? Workplace surveillance technology is a massive industry, and it is only expanding. So, do you have a right to privacy in your office? I don't know. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. IBM just announced earlier this year that they have a predictive capability that works to 95% accuracy to figure out whether or not an employee is going to leave. They're a flight risk, and they, of course, won't give away the ingredients of the secret sauce of their predictive algorithm. They don't have to. It's proprietary. Does that violate the rights of IBM's employees who have no ability to opt out of being surveyed by their employer? This might be yet another way that IBM could be tracking them. Here are some cops. One of the things I love being American and being here in Britain is that the cops don't have guns. I don't find them as scary here. It will be really interesting to see how people relate to the police who are quite approachable here in Great Britain, and I think that's a wonderful quality of your police force. If you think that your police are literally looking at you through glasses that can pull up, recognizing your face, whether or not you have any previous criminal convictions or an outstanding parking ticket or you were jaywalking or anything else, really. Are you a known associate? of someone that's a person of interest to them, perhaps they would like to question you. So I think it's just worth thinking about, like, is that what we want our police force looking like? At the same time, we want to help the police do their jobs and make the best use of technology, right? So it's very, we've got some very difficult decisions to make here. And I put this picture up as well from China because I think it's worth us asking if we want to live in a society that looks like this. It's really easy to talk about this technology in the abstract, but I think these pictures are quite powerful because it's not just the little box on the face and you're reduced to a number. It's that your face and that number links you to all of the other data that is known about you. And I can tell you that the data that is known about you, both from private sector sources and public sector sources, is immense. And that's just another sort of, you know, this is what it looks like. How do we match you? And that's people who are caught jaywalking, and so they get publicly shamed in China. Their faces, literally, as they're jaywalking in real time, are broadcast onto a big screen, and it's like, Stephanie Hare, what are you doing? Your mother raised you better. Why are you jaywalking? Oh my god, you need to pay your council tax bill as well, right? In China, this technology is taken to the absolute extreme and is used to help 
not just oppress 11 million Uyghur Muslims, but to intern them in a concentration camp network in the west of China. We have concentration camps here on Earth. It's happening. The cameras and technology are made by people like Huawei, which many of us will have heard about, SenseTime, Hikvision. Hikvision supplies cameras in this country. Some of them are on the parliamentary estate. This is all in the public record. So we need to have a big discussion about who is making this technology, where that data goes to, does it get beamed back to a foreign state, does it allow foreign states to surveil people here in Britain? And do we even want to be involved with anyone who is involved in that? This is not just about pay with your face or stop knife crime. It's about an entire holistic picture that is going to require us to make some very real value judgments. And we need laws and regulations to make sure that we are all comfortable as citizens with how we decide to use it, if we decide to use it. We're going to do a bit of time travel and geo travel and come back here to the United Kingdom because I'm sure we all think, ah, that's absolutely outrageous to equate the United Kingdom with China. We would never put people in concentration camps here. We would never be a police state here. We would never surveil people here. The front line in facial recognition. Police cameras in an East London street, everyone gets scanned. If you refuse, Here's what can happen. This man didn't want to be caught by the police cameras, so he covered his face. Police stopped him. They photographed him anyway. An argument followed. What's your suspicion? Yes, the, the fact that he walked past clearly marked. I would do the same. I would do the same. Just grounds to stop no, it doesn't. The police said this was disorderly behaviour, so they gave him a fine. The chap told me down the road, he said he got facial recognition. So I walked past like that. It's a cold day as well. Because I've done that, the police officers asked me to come to him, so I've got me back up. I said to him, f off, basically. I said, I don't want my face shown on, on, on anything. If I'm going to cover my face, I'll cover my face. It's not for them to tell me not to cover my face. Mm. I've got a now £90 fine. There you go. Look at that. Nin Thanks, Lex. £90. Well done. He was caught up in the last of 10 trials carried out by the Metropolitan Police. The Met have had successes. There were three arrests from facial recognition on this test day alone. But the trials have proved controversial. Opponents claim they're taking place in a legal vacuum. There is nothing in UK law that has the words facial recognition. There is no legal basis for the police to be using facial recognition. There are no legal limitations on how they can use it, no policy, no regulation. This is a free-for-all. We don't know who's on the watch lists. We didn't know how long the, the images were going to be stored for. And the police are kind of making up the rules as they go along. My ultimate fear is that we would have live facial recognition capabilities on our gargantuan CCTV network, which is about six million cameras in the UK. If that happens, the nature of life in this country would change. It would mean that everywhere we go, we could be identified, tracked, that we would be leaving a location data trail, um, that your face could be searched and a detailed record of your movements gained. Police argue that, in a time when every smartphone camera has facial recognition, why should they be left behind? I believe, uh, as does the Commissioner and the Management Board and the Met, believe not trialling such technology will be neglectful. Actually, we ought to explore all technology to see how it can keep people safer, how it can make policing more effective. However, we are completely aware of some of the concerns that are raised, and what we're doing with these trials is actually trying to understand those better so we can actually protect human rights, but also keep people safe at the same time. We're, we're reviewing all capabilities in terms of light facial recognition, and absolutely the technology is there for body-worn or smaller devices to be fitted with facial recognition technology, as is CCTV. So um, absolutely we will look at that, but again, the, the right safeguards and the right reviews and learning has to be put, put, put around that. So that was from BBC Click that came out just a few weeks ago. 
And now we're going to tackle the nothing to hide, nothing to fear argument. And you can let me know, by the way, if I've convinced you at the end, if you're still like, no, I'm fine with it. Um, I'd love to hear what you have to say. So I took this picture because I happened randomly to be going to LBC to give an interview on facial recognition when I walked by it, and I did see that it was on Twitter. That does not look like a police van to me. I've lived here since 1998. Police vans are normally very well labeled. So I was like, what the hell is this? And there were ununiformed or plainclothes police officers as well as uh, you know, dressed in their, their proper outfits. I wanted to know, you know, if the Home Office has nothing to hide, right? Because the whole nothing to hide, nothing to fear argument is always put on you, right? The individual, the citizen, the purpose. I want to know, if they have nothing to hide, why are they hiding it in this unmarked green van? Like, why aren't the cops in their normal uniforms? Um, people didn't know that their faces were being taken. They did not consent to being part of a trial. If you're going to ask me to trial your new drug, you damn well better expect that I'm signing a consent form and I'm lawyered up in case you make me sick, right? So why are they allowed to just experiment with technology on people? That's my body. That is my body data that they are taking. And I would also like to know when the Home Office plans on reporting back to Parliament and the public about this technology. We have had many trials. We're very lucky that two of the directors of some of the most important civil liberties outfits in this country are here and can talk to us about how many trials we've done. We've done enough trials, we have the data set, now we can have a little chat about what we want to do with that. It's not scheduled in the parliamentary diary. When, when do we get the report? So I would like them to show us that they have nothing to hide and nothing to fear about what they are doing. I also think we have a tiny problem because they do have something to hide, which is this. They've got 10 million people's facial images in police databases, and they are not all of convicted criminals. Innocent people's pictures are in those databases, and my, my friends who are engineers here will know that that was a design choice. They could have actually designed the database differently so that they did not put innocent people's pictures in, and when they were asked why they hadn't removed it, the Home Office said it would be too expensive. Sorry, not good enough. And what I love is that when HMRC, the tax authority, was found to have been recording people's voices without their consent, and your voice data is very urgent. That's actually going to be the next thing I think that will freak people out. From a 30-second voice sample, people can not only reconstitute 60 to 70% of what you look like, guess your ethnicity, your age, your gender. There is medical research showing that from a 30-second voice sample, they can detect whether or not you have Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or cardiovascular disease before you start showing symptoms, before your doctor could tell that you have it. So your voice data being out there, being used, and in my country, in the United States, there's a lot of healthcare providers who would love to deny people healthcare insurance if they could figure out that they were sick and had a pre-existing condition. These people have no morals at all. They will do that. It has to be protected. Here in the, the UK, we have the NHS, so I'm hoping we don't have to worry about that. But as I said, we have to think globally about how this tech will be used. HMRC was taking people's data without their consent, recording their voices, and the information commissioner's office was asked to look into that and told them to delete it. So they had to. So the ICO could just as easily tell the Home Office, you delete those innocent people's pictures from your criminal database. They do not belong in a police convicted criminal's database. That is a choice. Liberty, we have the director here today, has brought legal action against the South Wales police. We've got a judgment coming. I will let Martha speak about that. Big Brother Watch might be bringing legal ac action against London Met. I think we're waiting to see on that. We've got Griff, their legal officer. I'll let him speak to that. We've got the ICO investigating the use of facial recognition. One of the criteria that Elizabeth Denham, their director, has said she will be looking at is, could you solve crime? Can you prevent terrorism in other ways? E.g., are you using facial recognition because that is literally the only or the best tool that we can give you? Because if it is, we need to have an honest conversation about that as a society. If it isn't, or if it might be, but it depends, then we need to map that out. That is what responsible technology is about. So the ICO is on it. We pay for this technology to be used on us in trials without our knowledge or our consent. We then pay for the police effort to defend themselves against legal action. 
So as a British taxpayer, I hope you're feeling really happy about how your tax dollars are going, or tax pounds. Um, and then we're paying for our regulator to investigate HMRC and the cops. You are paying for this. That is why I would like to see Parliament do their jobs and craft some laws. My favorite part about this story is that the Home Office has already been told by a court, and not just any court, a high court, that it is unlawful to keep innocent people's images in the police databases. And they dithered on this for five years. In 2017, they came up with a workaround. The workaround is this. If you know or think that your, your picture might be in a police database, you can request to have it deleted. So the onus is on you. Tech companies love to do this, and governments love to do this. The way that they will give you a little bit of your rights is rather than do the job themselves or build it as a default to protect your privacy, they'll give you customer and citizen choice. You can choose to ask to have your image removed from a criminal database, right? It's crazy. Most people don't know that they have this right. As a result, very few people have asked to have their picture deleted, so the police could be like, well, no one's bothered by it because no one's asking, except that maybe no one's asking because they didn't know that they could. And my favorite part is a significant number of people who do apply have their applications rejected anyways. This should trouble you. I interviewed Norman Lamb, who's the head of the Science and Technology Committee at the House of Commons last year for the BBC, and he said this is not a satisfactory position. We have a situation where the automatic deletion of DNA and fingerprints, you will recall the only biometrics that are named and protected in law, those are automatically deleted if you are arrested and then released without charge or acquitted. They have to delete it. It's spelt out in law. If they weren't to do it, you could bring legal action against and win. It's not protected for face, voice, or any other biometric. So, Mr. Lamb will be eager to receive your calls, emails, etc., saying that you would like to see this rectified. Uh, he's very much in favor of that. I also interviewed the UK Biometrics Commissioner, Professor Paul Wiles, who says, we now have an entire generation of biometrics that are being experimented with or deployed by the police, but they are also being used by the commercial sector. This really needs a legislative framework. The government's biometric strategy, which they put out last year, June 2018, does not address this. He called it disappointing and not a strategy. Okay, update to be published this month. I have seen nothing about it. It's entirely possible, given that the government punted this from 2012, that they will punt again. And they will keep punting unless British people hold them to account. So we need to hold them to account. But let's stop away from the government for a bit and ask ourselves about our friends in the private sector. They're fine with this technology, right? It's fine. You can code in protections, everything's cool, and make a lot of money making people safer, and it's more convenient. There are real benefits to this tech. Except, and I really enjoyed this, by the way, we have an incredible reporter here from the Financial Times who broke a wonderful story about Microsoft quietly deleting a database of 10 million images relating to 100,000 people. Those images were taken without their consent, used by Microsoft to train their facial recognition algorithms that were then shared with loads of other companies, including making their way over to China, to those camps, awkward, awkward for their corporate social responsibility department. And yet here they are. That is Brad Smith, Microsoft president, saying, and he said this before the FT broke the story, it's almost as if he knew, a government could follow anyone anywhere, or for that matter, everyone everywhere. It could do this at any time or even all the time. It could unleash mass surveillance on an unprecedented scale. Yes, Brad, you helped make that happen. Satya Nadella, laughing away over here, ha ha ha, so much fun making surveillance tech, says, as if he's not participating in this, facial recognition technology is just terrible. It's this terrible thing. It's a race to the bottom. What can be done about it? You're the CEO, mate. You can do something about it. You could choose not to build it. You could stipulate that it can't be sent to China and used in camps. You know, you're right. It's better to have a modicum of rules. So they want the government to legislate. They want the government to legislate while taking people's data, building the algorithms, sharing it. And P.S., deleting that data set did nothing. That data set is out there now. 
once you capture the data, it's gone. And it's being shared, it's all over GitHub, other developers have it. So massive, massive topic for their next shareholder meeting. Google is saying we're not even getting involved. Right? So I think when Google doesn't want to get involved, we probably want to look at it, because they're involved in all sorts of very interesting stuff. They're waiting. They're looking. Amazon, totally going for it, selling to the cops right now. The fact that their tech has been proven to have racial bias, not troubling them. IBM, also one of my favorites, following only Microsoft and being completely hypocritical, took people's data from Flickr, the photo sharing app, and used it to build their surveillance technology. They're doing some very interesting things in developing countries. Really happy to talk with people about that after. I like that they built into their own technology tags so that you can identify people by their ethnicity. Why would you want to do that? We end here. We don't have to use this technology at all. We could ban it. I want that to be an option that the United Kingdom considers. I'm not going to recommend whether or not we should. That is not my place. I am going to say I think we need to discuss if we want to ban it or have a moratorium on any further testing until we pass legislation. San Francisco has come up with a ban. We're going to discuss that here, so I won't go into the details. It's a very nuanced ban. Other parts of the United States are considering it. London wants to be one of the leading tech cities in the world, and the United Kingdom wants to be one of the leading countries in the world for technology. Let's lead on being responsible. And I will end on this slide. This is for people who would like to social media it. These are the people that need to hear from you. These are the people that need to be put into your hashtags, emailed, phoned, written to. They work for you. They will not pass that legislation. They will blame it on Brexit or punt it unless you force them to. So we've got two of the people here that we can talk to from Liberty and Big Brother Watch. We've got a great panel. I hope this has given us some good food for thought. And I will leave on this slide and come join them. Thank you very much. OK, thank you so much, um, Stephanie. Uh, that was really uh, interesting and a little bit frightening at times, I must say. Um, so we've got quite a esteemed panel and quite a big panel. Um, and I hope everyone can um, spare a thought for uh, Sean Moore here, who is the only person on the panel from a facial recognition company. So, <laughs> but he's, he's up for this, aren't you, Sean? So thank you so much for that. And I just want to start with just asking the audience, based on what you heard just now um, from Stephanie Hare, how many people here think we should not have facial recognition at all in society from companies, from governments? Anybody? Okay. Okay. And how many people are a little bit concerned, but they're not really sure? They're just a bit concerned about it. Okay, so quite a mix. I actually thought we'd have more people who were concerned about it. So it sounds like it, there's people on both sides of this. Um, and so I do want to start with Sean here. We're, and we are going to keep the topic focused on facial recognition. We've really interesting things on voice, but let's talk about faces. Um, you're the CEO of TrueFace. You have contracts with governments, companies. You are not able to say who those clients are because they're under NDA. But tell us a little bit about what those clients are doing with your technology and why you're OK with it and why we should all be OK with it. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, before I get to that, I just wanted to make a couple quick points here. Uh, one is that San Francisco did not actually ban the technology. They made it so that if law enforcement wants to use facial recognition, they have to get a warrant to do so. Uh, San Francisco was not using facial recognition before this, and they didn't intend to use it. So it's not a ban. It's just putting regulation around how that technology can be used. Uh, the okay. second point is that facial recognition is not bias. Humans are bias. Data is bias. The technology itself is not bias. The third point is the government does not need facial recognition to surveil you. They have social media. They have your phone records. They have your credit card statements. So you, know, you really need to think about this more holistically than just surveillance. And then the fourth is that 
currently the cost to run facial recognition in a city is millions and millions and millions of dollars. So we're not at a state right now in the industry in which that's possible. So this is the time to regulate the technology as it's being tested. And I do agree that to test this technology on un unknowing people is a bit inappropriate, but in the industry that is the only way to collect real information. And without collecting real information, you will not know where the issues lie. So it's a bit of a moral question for everyone here, but without real deployment of this technology with people who don't know that it's watching them, you will not get the information you need to see if it's accurate enough to identify people that you are looking for. So. And, and just quickly, Sean, can you tell us how your customers are using, is it your software? Do you sell cameras or how does it work? So we sell direct into our customers, uh, into their local infrastructure. So it's not a cloud API. You can't just go onto our site and buy our technology. We spend at least six months with our customers to know exactly how they're using it. And we work in uh, retail, we work in hospitality, we work in law enforcement, banking. And so a couple of the ways, they're primarily all opt-in ways. So online bank opening to reduce fraud, uh, ATM transactions, to, again, to reduce fraud, and the hospitality space, it's VIP recognition. So it's opt-in. You actually, as you enter that hotel, we pick up the VIPs, pass that information to the concierge, and they approach you with your key card and your personal information. Now, a way that you can protect people who are not opting in or who have opted out is we actually blur everyone's face in real time. Uh, and so it's, the data is completely fleeting. We're not collecting imagery from your face at all. And the time that it's processing is when we can pick up if it's you or not, and if it's not the person that's opted in, it's completely erased. Uh, another important point is facial recognition is not taking an image and storing that image. Facial recognition is taking an image taking a mathematical representation of that image, and each company does that in its own specific way and storing that information. So if you were to hack into our system or hack into a company using our technology, you cannot reverse engineer those numbers to pull out a face. Okay. Um, I want to take it to Griff from Big Brother Watch. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because Sean makes some interesting points there. You know, the government can already surveil us through all these other signals from social media. Um, there's clearly, you've got these guardrails in place. You're blurring the faces and so forth. But your view is we still, still shouldn't have it. I think live facial recognition in, in public spaces is a, is a massive step beyond what there is currently. Yes, of course, we all use social media. Um, that's something, and, and, and the internet, and that's something we very much opt into. But when we go into public spaces, we don't opt into the government knowing where we are, who we're with, what our movements were previously, um, giving, uh, give, giving the government, the police, um, information about us and how we live our lives. Um, I think there are some very serious concerns about how that will change democracy. It gives the police and, and the state incredible power over us to know exactly where we are and, and what we're doing. And as uh, Stephanie's already given several examples of um, how this technology has been used in China in a, in a very authoritarian way, tracking citizens uh, around the country. It's being used to oppress and control the uh, ethnic Muslim Uyghur mi minority in China. Um, it, it's being used to, to control them and put them in camps. Um, it's also being used against political dissidents. It's being used against people with mental health problems. And that's, unfortunately, that may seem intangible. That may seem very over there. That may not seem real here. But we've seen all of those things already happen in the UK. Uh, UK police have used this technology uh, to track and monitor people with mental health problems. Uh, they've used it to track and monitor uh, ethnic minorities uh, at culturally black events like the Notting Hill Carnival. Uh, and we've seen them use it at a, a protest. Yeah. So, yes, we aren't quite there yet, but we've, we've seen all of these uh, principles be used here in the UK. Okay. And it's, it's just a matter of time if we don't do something about it. A matter of time before, and because this is kind of reminiscent of what we were hearing from Stephanie in, in, in her presentation, it sounds like the, can, one of the big concerns, particularly from, from you guys at Big Brother Watch, is that police will get things wrong. They'll get the wrong person, like they got that... This guy on the street, he's not, he hasn't done anything, but it turned into this kind of altercation. Um, uh, let me bring it to Roland Sykes, uh, Roland from Sky News, sorry. Um, you've done some work on predictive policing. You, you did a really interesting program on um, what South Wales police were doing with this kind of stuff. Um, but I know you have some thoughts on actually what, what, is, what about if they get it really accurate? If it works really well, isn't that all okay? Would that make this all okay? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. Is this stuff more scary if it's not accurate or if it's really accurate? And at the moment with the, the Met Police, um, for instance, the main focus is on how inaccurate it is. 
but we're all assuming that at some point it will be really accurate. I guess there are two things to say. But first, um, no, tech, no algorithm is completely accurate. Every complex algorithm has collateral damage. Um, and the second thing to say is, is you've got to think about for whom. Who is it accurate for? Mm. And who will it make life better for if it is accurate? What, from what we've seen you know, from the last 15 years of deployment of this, of this kind of surveillance technology is that it's the most vulnerable people who are often, it's often inaccurate for, but also who is used against the most. So in this, in this world in which facial recognition is deployed widely, you can imagine that actually it would, it would make life better for a lot of people. That actually it would improve people's lives in lots of little ways, making life more convenient at the airport. That'd be nice. But for a large subsection, or you know, maybe as kind of, you know, even a large, like a kind of sizable minority of the population, it would make their life worse in a really, really major way. But then the way to kind of counter that would just be to be really careful about who you sell this stuff to. Like um, Trueface, your company might have the best facial recognition system in the world. If it did, are you? And let's say it does now. Are you um, discerning about who you sell this stuff to? Have you said no to anybody? We have said no. Um, we've said no for various reasons in, in different regions of the world as well. Uh, it, it is important to know who you're selling it to and how they're using the technology. So we do have those guardrails in place now, yes. And how do you make that decision? It's a, a moral and ethical decision that has to be made. Uh, and we made that as a company in 2017. We set up essentially standards for our company and how okay. we make decisions for sales. You've got a list of standards we you do. go through with each potential contract. Okay. Um, let me bring this over to, to Martha from Liberty Human Rights. What was your reaction when you were watching that video of, of the man um, having that altercation from the police? Because I know you, you've seen that before and it really struck you before, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a salutary bit of footage that it can catch anyone wrongly and that you might decide that you don't want your face to be taken by one of these cameras, but the act of, I mean, that isn't even an act of civil disobedience in my view, um, will have the full force of the criminal law coming down on you. I think one of the things that meant that people sat up and listened is that that's a white man. Um, when Roland talks about the people that this technology most adversely affects, whether it's inaccurate or accurate, we are very often talking about people of colour. We're talking about people who already face discrimination from the police in many, many different ways. We all know the statistics, for example, on stop and search. We know that people of colour are criminalised more easily. We know that they face longer sentences. We know that their interactions with the police are very often violent by the police. You know, we hear about companies saying that well, we have a list of standards and we wouldn't engage with people and we wouldn't sell this technology. But to my mind, point me to a police force in the world that isn't racist or tell me that we are not selling this technology to police forces. And, and those are the, the reason that video is interesting is because it shows you that it, this technology affects all of us. It affects how we all interact with public spaces, as Griff says. It, is, it affects whether we decide to go to protest, whether we decide to go and pray somewhere or, or to hang out with people who might have been in trouble with the police. Uh, there's been plenty of research about how surveillance distorts human behavior, pre-criminal behavior, non-criminal behavior. So if you roll out surveillance like this on our streets in ways that we can't necessarily discern, you're effectively using an instrument of social control to mean that people will alter their behavior in myriad ways, even though supposedly we live in a free democracy where things like the right to protest and free expression are absolutely essential to the working of that democracy. But I think the equality point is absolutely essential. Accurate or inaccurate, law enforcement marginalizes, demonizes particular communities. And this technology, whether in and of itself it is biased, will be used by people where bias is already entrenched. And we have, unfortunately, no answer to dealing with police racism. And so you shouldn't equip them with even more invasive tools to be able to enact that racism on an even greater scale. I've got to ask, Sean, what's your response to that? Yeah, I'd say that y you make some valid points, but something you're not considering is in four days in India, they found 3,000 missing children. So imagine one of those children was yours. That's an incredible use of this technology. They're con continuing to find sex trafficked women throughout all over India, and we're bringing that technology to the US. So you have to take a look at the balance there. I, I see what you're saying. 
in, in my thought to that is it actually provides a layer of accountability because now in the field as an officer, if you're making a judgment decision where you've potentially seen a picture before, you can just say, I made a judgment decision. Now you have photographic evidence of facial recognition and a confidence score for why you made that decision. So I think there's more base in, in that than just going off of human nature, which has been proven to be incorrect many, many times. Do you, so, do you think that's a fair argument, um, either Griff or, or, or um, sorry, Martha? Like, this is kind of the lesser evil, and therefore it's okay, because that's just the price to pay to, to help find a child. I think allowing private companies, profit-driven companies, to set the terms by whether or not we should be using this technology is a huge problem uh, in and of itself. You're referring we, to the standards that he the, follows exactly, the to standards decide a that, contract. that many of these companies say they have. They say they have ethics boards. You know, Google had a great big ethics board, which disbanded after everyone left when they realized it was actually completely meaningless. We can't trust private profit-driven companies to be setting the standards by which we will be putting uh, communities under surveillance, putting whole populations under surveillance, and and, and changing the way that in the, the people interact with the state, giving the state huge power. That should not be left to companies to decide. There's also, I think it's very easy in these conversations to assume that facial recognition is the only tool available to police. Police have a huge array of tools, both pre-digital and post-digital, which they can use to track missing people, to deal with sexual exploitation, to fight crime, and to protect us all on the streets. Facial recognition, no police force can say that they absolutely need facial recognition in order to be able to do their jobs. If they oh. could, we wouldn't have the situation that we have in San Francisco. Okay, yeah, but, but um, so that point, but also Griff's point that you guys shouldn't even be making that decision. So the issue that you run into is exactly what happened with Facebook. When you leave it to legislation to write legislation about something they have no idea, you end up running into an issue where you don't understand what you're trying to regulate. So I am all for regulation. I am for federal reg regulation, not city regulation or even state regulation and, in the United so States. And so is Mark Zuckerberg. He's asking to be <laughs> regulated. Would you I, feel the same way? Yeah, or? I've actually reached out to our state senators. Um, I've reached out federally as well so I could be in that conversation. Yeah, I, I absolutely do. I think it's important for society. And we know the limitations way better than anyone else. And so we have to have a voice there because we know what it can and can't do. And if someone's trying to regulate it that doesn't intimately understand that, we're going to run into an issue. So, and, and to your point there, there was a great article in the New York Times from an officer, and what they said was they've already found over, I think, a thousand people in the time that they've trialed that they would not have otherwise found without facial recognition. So, it, it effectively takes something that takes 14 days down to about 30 minutes to find an individual. And again, I, I, think, I think we're getting lost in the fact that everyone's thinking about mass surveillance. They're not mass surveilling. They're looking for specific people. And they have a, at least in New York, they have a list of specific people they're looking for that have committed a crime. So Griff is shaking his head there. I mean, it, it is mass surveillance. It, it biometrically scans every single person within a public space, checking them against a watch list. That, that is a form of mass surveillance. It treats your face like a fingerprint or a DNA swap. I mean, how many people here would be willing to uh, give their fingerprint or have their DNA swapped when they were coming in here? That's how it treats uh, a public space or a concert or a protest. That's what it's doing. And it's doing it without your knowledge um, uh, and, and without your consent. That's, that's actually not what, what's happening. <laughs> They're forensically using this right now. They're using it after a crime has been committed and running it on that specific footage. So I, I don't know how they're using it here. I'm not aware of, of the police forces using it here. But in the United States, they're running it completely forensic. So it is after the fact. It is not in real time. Like I said earlier, it would cost far too much. OK, and one, I want to ask a quick question, one more quick question to Sean, and then I'm going to bring it over to Heaton, because we're going to talk a little bit about solutions here. Um, you mentioned that you're talking to your state senator. Uh, people always have this knee-jerk reaction to regulation where they say governments are so slow and regulators are just so slow and tech moves so fast. Just in a nutshell, is that what you're experiencing? Is it quite slow or do you think they're moving fairly quickly on no, this? No, I, I think they are moving fairly quickly. You saw with San Francisco, the fact that that was even a topic this early on shows you that they are moving fast. And there are, the state of Illinois has already passed legislation. The state of Texas is passing legislation. And the state of California is set to pass it next year. So I, at least in the United States, they are moving very fast. The problem with state-by-state -state regulation is you've got companies and, and the government that operates across all of them. So the state of Illinois has banned the technology for commercial use, but not for government use. The state of California wants to ban it for government use, but not commercial use. So it has to be federally regulated. Yeah, super, super interesting to see how they do it in the U.S. because you've got everything done on the state level and then you set all these precedents and kind of almost use it as a test bed each state. Um, 
over to, to Hitan, you're um, with the Ada Lovelace Institute, um, as well as the Royal Statistical Society, but with your Ada Lovelace hat on, this is a new institute, you guys are looking at AI and data for social good, and you're also advising the government on this stuff. So, you know, what are the next steps here? You've heard what people have had to say on both sides of the table. Um, what, how are you going to be advising the government? Well, I think the, the thing that's really clear from this discussion is that policy in this area is a hot mess, right? Uh, mm. it, it is really complicated. That's why we don't have easy answers in this space. Uh, the Royal Statistical Society helped create the Ada Lovelace Institute as a body that can think long and hard about these issues. And we created it with the support of uh, bodies like Tech UK, who are here today. So the technology companies also saw a risk of fast regulation, which doesn't think things through. So the question for me is, where is the public in this? Where's the public voice? So the Ada Lovelace Institute is commissioning research now. What is the public thinking? What's deliberatively, if we give the public some space to think about these issues, where do we want to land as a democracy? What's the trade-off between convenience to be able to go through airport scanners or use your face to pay, as against some of the issues that we've heard about today? Where do we want to land on that? So one of the things we're now talking to a lot of stakeholders about is calling for a moratorium on the technology. And we think that this is actually in the private sector's interest as much as in citizens' interest, because if we get the wrong regulation quickly, we'll be in the wrong place. What so, do you mean calling for a moratorium so on technology? Say, Can you explain what you yeah, mean by that? Let, let's not adopt this technology for a period of time. Let's so you're say, saying let's pause it? A couple of years, yeah, pause uh, and think things through. Uh, and this, this has got precedent. So uh, the chief medical officer recently has uh, put forward a moratorium on, in the insurance industry on okay. genetic profiling kind of stuff. So, you know... Uh, and the industry bought into that because it recognizes you move too fast, you do the wrong thing, you lose your license to operate. So in the same way that we've seen, uh, which say genetically modified foods, the science got set back 10 years because the public in Europe really didn't support it. We need to find a path which gets social license to operate. And the best way to do that is to pause on the technology and to have this discussion, but in, in many fora around the country, and to think through the way forward. Okay, and just so I understand in terms of how this is going to actually happen, you are recommending that to central government moratorium on any particular industries? So or? we will, uh, 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 we're talking at the moment to stakeholders before we launch for this, but we think it's likely that we'll be talking to people on a sector by sector basis. Because, you know, the, the issues in criminal justice, as we've heard today, it, they are different to walking into airports, which is different again to border control. And so we'll need to think this through sector by sector. I mean, that could be a problem for companies like Trueface, right? Sean, does that make you rethink? Selling to the UK? No. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the security around these issues. Um, we were doing a report at the Wall Street Journal about how image recognition systems can be fooled. You can take a picture of someone's face, change a couple of pixels, and the image recognition system thinks it's broccoli or a cat <laughs> or something. Like, literally, this is you, hacker and academics are doing this. Um, Sean. It's not just an ethical issue. There's a huge security issue around here. They're stealing the training data. I know you said it's all math, but you know you, there were these hackers who stole um, face uh, images from a contractor to the U.S. Customs and Border Protection con uh, Control earlier this week. Um, huge security issues around this stuff. I mean, what what are you guys doing about that? Yeah, the adversarial attacks are are very interesting. I think they're more interesting for self-driving cars because people have been putting basically a QR code on a stop sign for that car to read that as a green light. And so that's where it becomes very, very yeah, interesting. Just, just to explain that. Um, so it's a stop sign. Um, some academic researchers, I wish we had a picture, but they literally put three black stickers, tiny stickers, and then a self-driving car image classification system thought it was a 45 mile per hour speed limit sign. Right. It didn't read it as a stop sign anymore. Right. That's very frightening to me. Um, and, and there are ways to to programmatically understand if the algorithm has been, in, been infected. And it's a continuous game of cat and mouse that always will be. People have makeup now that are s supposed to fool facial recognition. The, the issue with that um, at the, the level that you're talking about is we are running liveness checks. Uh, so you are making sure that the person behind that camera is actually a person and that you're not getting an infected result. Now, we have to actually work with academia on understanding what are the you know, newest ways to hack or to generate these types of attacks to figure that out. Uh, it, it is absolutely a risk, though.
Okay, so just segging on from that, and I, we, we're kind of running out of time here, so I want to just kind of open this question to anybody who wants to answer it. Um, but Stephanie, you were talking about China earlier and the ways that China is using technology, and we know here in the UK there's a huge controversy around using Huawei in our telecommunication systems. What about using, you know, how should governments make the decision about where they buy their facial recognition system from if they're going to buy this stuff? Um, is it better to buy it from Amazon or a startup from China? Should, should there be, um, you know, should they be careful about that decision? The, um, just on the, the one thing that really matters is that the government is able to get true transparency and true explainability right. of the data and the algorithm. I mean, right now, um, the, the Met and I think South Wales Police gets their stuff from NEC. As far as I understand, NEC do not allow the police to see the data. And NEC it, is from it's where? It's a Japanese company. It's a Japanese company, okay. Because it's a trade secret. This is, this is slightly different to the kind of geopolitical game of um, you know, which country it comes from. But I think that, is that, that element of being able to look deep inside it is really crucial. And that should be part of any legislative, legislative framework that we introduce. And, it, you know, but, and private companies will resist. So you might start to ask, why doesn't the government or the police forces make this sort of thing themselves in order to have total transparency and total auditability of it? Mm. It's a fundamental problem buying technology from uh, private companies. Their software is proprietary. They don't want uh, you to know how it works because then they wouldn't be able to make money off it and sell it. Um, so they, for example, using facial recognition technology, they won't test it to know whether it's demographically accurate, whether it uh, discriminate, discriminates against people of color or women, as has been found in uh, the technology which is used by the Metropolitan Police and South Wales Police in the UK. They refuse to do tests on it. Um, uh, but the, the, the Met, after three years of using it, have now admitted that it uh, misidentifies women more than men. Um, and when we've, uh, as examples have been raised of uh, people being misidentified based on race, uh, people being misidentified based on their gender, uh, it's, it's a huge problem and, and that's why any technology beyond facial recognition, any technology needs to be, as Roland has said, it needs to be explainable, it needs to be transparent, people need to know exactly how it works, especially before we start using it in the criminal justice system to make um, serious decisions which affect people's lives and their uh, their livelihoods. Uh, Martha, do you think it's okay for the British government, if they're going to buy facial recognition, should they avoid China, say yes to Amazon, or does that not, should that not factor in at all? They should just not buy it at all? I mean, I don't think they should buy it at all, but I agree with what's been said, that you, you can't have any accountability if you have black box, box decision making, which is what you have with, with much of this technology. Um, can I just make one final point? I thought it was interesting what Sean said about self-driving cars. It's a very relatable example to imagine how frightening it would be to be in a self-driving car that flies through a red light, to anglicize the, <laughs> the example. Um, there is another example that perhaps we on this panel don't necessarily relate to in the same way, which is it's very frightening indeed to be mistaken for someone who is suspected for a crime and to be arrested and to have your liberty taken away and to be pushed very far down the criminal justice system and perhaps lose your job and perhaps lose your kids and perhaps lose many of the things that are important to you. And that's, that's the frightening example that is equivalent to the self-driving car. It is as frightening, if not more frightening, with face recognition. Okay. I think it's, it's one crucial question with this stuff you've got to ask is once there's a list, how can you get off it? Yeah. People cannot get off lists. Their entire lives are being defined by something they, they might have done or might not have done in their teenage years, and there is no capacity for removing people from these lists. Mm. And we're building entire systems based on them, and it's, it's incredibly scary. Uh, a quick question to you, Sean. Um, they were talking about explainability. I'm curious how transparent you are with TrueFace. Uh, just by way of example, the images, the facial images that you have in your systems, is that your intellectual property? It is, yes. We collected that data ourselves. We paid individuals for, that, for their own data. So we actually hired people around the world to take pictures of themselves, so we gave them money for their image. We don't take any personal data from that, though. All we take is the image of the face. We don't need their name, their age, their gender, their, their birthday, nothing like that. Okay, so do you collect the images from anywhere else, like Flickr or no. anything like that? No. Okay, and um, if someone was to come to you and say, I'd like to see how your um, system works, I'd like to see all the training data, would you show that? Yeah, we do work in Las Vegas, and the Gaming Commission requires that. Um, so they need to ensure that there's no backdoor. Uh, the concern there is Chinese, a, a Chinese backdoor with what's happening with Huawei and Hikvision. So yeah, we, we actually do have to do that with some of our clients, yes. 
Okay. All right. Well, good to know. And thank you so much to our panel. I think that's been a nice kind of, although we only had you, Sean, I feel like, you know, you got a, <laughs> lot, of, <laughs> a lot of talking time, which was important, um, but we could hear kind of a broad array of, of, of points here. So thank you so much to everybody. And of course, to Stephanie for the talk. And thank you to our audience. Thank you.